morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning. Sorry about that. I've got a lot on the go here this morning. Let me put my heads trying to get a video queued up for the interview that I can show you. And with a guy, fellow Telly yesterday. So, welcome and good morning. Uh, once again, you've got a solo grizzly, which is fine. I can deal with that. Hoping Mr. Beaver's feeling better soon. So, let's uh, first off thank our title sponsors The Miss Fiend Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, CanadianTarot.com. And the Peppermaster. They've been with us for a long time, and we really do appreciate and love them for the support they've given us right from day one. So, if you don't know my name by now, well, welcome to the show. My name's Mr. Grizzly. This is the True North Eager, Eager Beaver Podcast, and yes, I am very tired today. Yesterday, I had two conferences to attend, and then had some recording to do last night for a book I'm narrating, and didn't was not very successful with it. So tonight is going to be a, an all-nighter, as the saying goes, because it needs to be... My deadline is the first, so I have to have it done for tomorrow. So it's going to be a heck of a day. Oh, my goodness. So yesterday, I, do, I was able to attend day two of the Canadian Lines to End Homelessness Conference at the uh, Rogers, formerly Shaw Centre, in downtown Ottawa. It was once known as the Congress Center, for those of you who might be familiar with this city. It is attached to the Rideau Center, right beside the Rideau Canal, adjacent to the Senate of Canada, the former uh, Grand Trunk Railway Station, right in, or Union Station, I should say, right in downtown Ottawa, across from the Chateau Laurier. So a little bit of a geography lesson for you there, for those of you who are unaware. I do have my, I had a short interview, about 11, 11 minutes, 11 and a half minutes. I had a chance to meet with Guy and chat with him. Absolutely charming fellow. He, as you can well imagine, was in demand for a lot of interviews yesterday, so I was happy to get a, little, a few minutes to chat with him. A really sweetheart of a guy, and he had some things to say, and I appreciate them, and I'm hoping you'll like them as much as I do. So, without any further ado, let's just get right to it, shall we? I'll uh, air the video, and then we'll see you on the other side. Well, we'll get back to the interview in a few moments here, so hopefully I can get it up and operational. Oh, thank you, Cassie. Uh, I hope you liked the interview or the conversation interview that the chat I had with um, Ian DeYoung from Org Code, absolutely charming gentleman who knows his stuff when it comes to working with unhoused folks. And the number one thing that, that he agrees on, along with myself and Guy, is, is keep people alive first. If they need a safe supply, get them a safe supply. Keep them alive. And then from there, we work on getting them clean and sober and housed. 
and it takes time and you can't forcibly put somebody into rehab. I know sometimes you want to, but the thing is you can't make, you lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. <laughs> it's all of our teachers. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah, so I am quite tired, like I said, from yesterday. I had a lot of running around to do to take care of a number of things. I had a few interviews and met with a bunch of clients yesterday and some prospective. I had to develop some prospective business for my other line of work. So, yeah, it's a busy day. It's a busy day yesterday, a busy day today. Tonight I will be doing an all-nighter to hit my deadline for tomorrow. So I apologize if I come off as a little bit tired and cranky this morning because I am good. Yes, Dan, you are correct about that. You know what the funny thing is, though? Like, I've, I've noticed, too, that in our chat, most of the chat is, uh, most of the individuals in the chat are women. Yet our audience on YouTube apparently skews largely male. So what do we got to do to get more ladies watching? Somebody tell me. I'm happy to do it. Have more female guests? Sure, absolutely. Thing is, trying to get guests lined up sometimes is difficult, and not everybody wants to come on camera. Not everybody wants to talk out loud or talk in a public square, I guess you could say. They have things to say, but sometimes they just want to be anonymous. And I can understand that. Not everybody wants to be put into the public eye. It can be a bit of a challenge at times, and it can be very frustrating when once you're in the public eye, you are now a target. You have a target painted on your back for everybody who doesn't know you but suddenly has an opinion about you. Yeah. It's complex and complicated, and I just don't know what to tell you. I can't yeah, lead a horse to water, right? So we are hoping to get you some more interviews today. I say we, Mr. Beaver is supporting me emotionally because he's physically not able to at the moment. He is quite ill and sitting at home and trying to get better. So hopefully we'll have him back for tomorrow, but nobody knows. We don't know. Hopefully he's feeling better soon. Today will be another busy day, like I said, and I'm hoping that I can land a few interviews. There, were, there was, I, I missed Sean Fraser, housing minister. He was there yesterday, but I didn't get a chance to meet with him, unfortunately, as I was running around. Hopefully, I don't know if he's back again today. If he is, I'll see if I can grab him for a quick meet and greet on camera. If he doesn't want to do that, that's fine. He's a busy fella. That's how life goes sometimes. Breathe a sigh of relief. Well, yeah, I'm going to reach out to Karina Gould and see if uh, she'll come on the show. We featured some of her videos in the past and we'll do so more in the future because she always has some wonderful things to say. And I believe her to be a very good person who's trying to make a difference in this world. So I would love to have her as a guest some morning. Now, let me see if I can get back to the, the interview and see if it'll actually play for us. It is uploaded. I don't know why it's not playing now. Sometimes... Technology doesn't do what we want it to do. So I'm going to start it right from the top. Let's try this now. I do have the video loaded up and it will play in its entirety. It just took a little bit of work on my end to make it happen. So apologies. So here I am again and I present to you our 11 minute chat with myself along with Guy Felicella, who is an advocate for safe consumption sites, an advocate for the homeless, an advocate for the downtrodden. I hope you enjoy this. It was a nice conversation. I was rocking back and forth a bit. I'm here with Guy Felicella. Great to meet you, sir. Great to meet you. Finally, we, we had a chance to meet face to face. Uh, unfortunately, I did miss the keynote this morning, but I, I can catch it later in the day. Yeah. It's been a very busy day for me thus far, but thanks for taking a few minutes to talk to us. Um, we have been following you on the Twitter. Uh, we've shown some of the videos that you've posted. And not only that, we've also shown times when you've confronted with politicians that are trying to use people as a cudgel and that's the term i i've come up with for it come up with well, that i used we don't care for that and we like the way that you've been advocating for people who have addictions because it's an illness and it needs to be treated what are your thoughts on how the province of ontario is now beginning to close safe consumption sites and how can we fight and counter that well the irony behind it is that you guys have created easier access to liquor, yeah, but harder access to uh, a life-saving supervised consumption site for people who use substances. And unfortunately, what they're not, what the, the government of Ontario isn't telling people is that this is going to create more overdoses, uh, more public consumption, absolutely, more brain injuries, 
uh, more uh, strain on our health care system. system. And, and then also, too, uh, more taxpayer-funded paying off those health costs. And, um, and court costs and policing costs. And... Oh, I mean, they're, they're actually going so far back to, yeah. um, to uh, a philosophy in the 90s and 80s, which never worked in the, place, uh, the first place. Never. And so it's, just, it's, it's really heartbreaking because essentially what they're saying is that if you don't want recovery, then we don't want to support you. Yeah. And without saying that addiction is a chronic relapsing condition, and without a harm reduction safety net, then we're basically sending people to treatment only to leave and use again and then sadly die alone. And, it, and, it, and it's a repeating cycle, right? It never ends because you forcing someone into treatment when they're not ready to go doesn't work. Yeah, it well, never has. Yeah. And how about build more voluntary treatment? No like, kidding. Like where people have access to it when they need it. And what, what often isn't talked about with harm reduction is that it's a bridge to recovery services. It wasn't recovery services that came to the downtown east side to get me. It was actually harm reduction folks encouraging me right. to go to treatment because they were concerned for my life. And so that's the, the part that where I talked about this morning about human connection that can build a relationship and change the direction of somebody's life. Well, that's, that's fantastic. That's amazing. And as we've spoken about on our show, and that's why we've been trying to get a hold of you for a while, but I know you're a busy fella. So thanks for taking a few minutes to talk to us. But one of the things we've been trying to advocate for is safe supply and safe consumption sites due to the fact that as when they close those sites, what happens? Well, the safe supply disappears. So they go to the street and no one, it's probably fentanyl laced. And then what happens? Well, if you don't get to them quickly enough with Narcan and in many cases with when it comes to fentanyl, Narcan is going to be useless, right? Yeah. Because fentanyl, if it's car fentanyl, like the grain, the size of a grain of salt is enough to kill you. And we don't know what's being laced with the street drugs. Yeah. So we could, I think the way they rolled it out in British Columbia wasn't the most informed method when they were, started to come up with safe supply. Like I, the sites were great, the safe consumption sites. And when the government said, we're going to try a safe supply of, of narcotics, I don't think they went about it in the correct manner. Now, I'm not an expert on this. I, I like the idea that they were trying to bring in safe supply mm -hmm. for addicts. I just don't think it was probably rolled out in the correct manner. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I, first off, there's not many people that actually access it right. uh, in the first place. For some people, it, 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 it isn't as effective. Mm -hmm. uh, but for some people, it, it is very effective where it has removed them from the unregulated poison drug supply. One of the things that I look at is Switzerland and other countries in Europe that have heroin programs. Right. And... Those programs are actually very beneficial for people mm -hmm. who are struggling. And guess what? It's like the interesting thing where people often don't reflect about on prescribed alternatives is that it doesn't always remove people from the unregulated drug right. supply, but it does help alleviate a lot of withdrawal symptoms for people so that they don't have to do something out of character when they are in withdrawal. And so it's very important to be mindful that there's uh, a bunch of different aspects mm -hmm. of how it can impact people. There's many people who get methadone and Suboxone and still use the unregulated street supply. So yes. does that mean that methadone and Suboxone are failing and it's not enough? You no, know, it's just because people use drugs for different reasons. And a lot of the reasons behind why people are using drugs is because they're struggling with trauma, lack of access to housing. So we that. push people to the brink. And being homeless is the most mentally and physically punishing condition I've ever experienced in my life. And so these simplified slogans of bring your loved ones home drug free. No, because listen, you don't just walk into recovery mm -hmm. treatment and walk out the back door and your life gets better. The no. unfortunate reality, what these recovery only advocates talk don't, aren't talking about is that it being a chronic relapsing condition and without right. that harm reduction safety net, people will die. And I'm very supportive of all pathways. So whatever need, works for that person, right? We need all the harm reduction in, uh, services and we need all the recovery services, but we also need before all of this, we need a housing first approach. If we Bingo. give people housing, they're able to shut off their minds, rest physically and figure out the other issues in their lives. Well, that's such a big aspect of it. And I had a conversation yesterday with a gentleman about that, and I'll send you links to that if you'd like to have a look at it as well. 
in in De Young from Org Code, who talked about the moment somebody gets into a home, that a lot of the stress starts to melt away. It's like you don't have to think, okay, where can I find a toilet? Right. I need to shower. I need to clean my clothes. You don't think about those. That goes away from you. So that eases your mind a bit. And as they've proven in Finland, getting people into homes gets them into programs, gets yeah. them off, gets them clean. The stress that one must go through living on the street, I've never known. I have friends in my neighborhood who are on the street right now. I have friends who are under, they're housed, but ODSP doesn't cover their, so they're out on the street trying to right. get a few extra bucks because that ODSP doesn't get crawled, which is Ontario Disability Support Program, right? right? If you go out and you earn a couple of bucks, ODSP takes that away from you. So it's like, they're not letting you get ahead. Yeah. We always try to hold people back. You know what I mean? We do the bare minimum and off bare and, minimum. and we fund the bare minimum mm -hmm. and expect maximum results. That's the problem. And, and, and we're doing this with vulnerable individuals who've been pushed to the margin. Yeah. And you know what? A lot of these people, media, politicians, they've never experienced homelessness in their life. They've never experienced, listen, they go, I, I've known many people that have done sleep outs for Covenant House for mm -hmm. one night and they describe how challenging that was. And I was one like, night. yeah. And I was like, yeah, and they try doing that for 10, 20 years. Yeah. Like you're going to have a different outlook in your life. And you know what? We don't give people opportunity. It's not just get off the drugs. No. It's what about a home? What about a job? What about purpose? And then you know what people like to do is they like to judge you for your past and yeah. bring that up and think that they're better than you because they don't like you or what you support. And so for me, to me, listen, there's, I don't, I've said this, but I'm not going to ask you for advice. I really don't care what you have to say about me. Right. Uh, you go ahead and say whatever you want, but I'm going to keep doing what I want and I'm going to keep calling out the injustices. I'm going to keep calling out the misinformation and I'll always be there to reply. Every now and then when I feel fit, and especially if it's in my wheelhouse right. of harm reduction, homelessness, and recovery treatment, because the false narrative that many people are portraying isn't um, because they care about people. Mm -hmm. It's they're vying for political opportunism and votes off the lives of people's backs who are struggling. And we know who's been doing a lot of that. <laughs> yes. The Gentleman who refuses to get his security clearance, who shall remain unnamed, but we all know who he is. <laughs> yeah, no, man, it's like you, you just bring it home. See what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you really do because you, you lived experience, number one. Number two, you've been living a clean and sober life for 15 years now? Almost 12. Almost 12, sorry. Yeah. Congratulations, by Thank the way. You. That's wonderful. And I know how much of a challenge and a struggle that can be because when you have a tough day, like I... Look, I'm not going to lie. I enjoy a glass of wine, a whiskey, or a beer. Yeah. I've never used anything stronger than that. Yeah. I suffer from migraines every day of my life. Yeah. Aspirin is the strongest medication I can take. Yeah. And there are days when we've had a rough day and it's like, I'm going to go to the pub just to have a couple of pints and blow off some steam. Yeah. I don't recommend that. It's not good. Yeah. I enjoy the conversation. Now they have Guinness Zero, so I can have a zero pint. Yeah. <laughs> right? Which is good. That's healthier, right? Yeah. But harm reduction, harm, it is harm reduction though. That's the thing. And it's in a safe consumption site. Too, there you go. Because huh? go all the, bigger. right. The, the bartenders and the, and the staff are there to make sure that if you get served too much, they'll take you home properly, so put you in a, whatever the case may be. So Cab why, Uber. yeah, exactly. So why aren't we doing this for people who are using a different drug? Because alcohol is a drug. Well, there's the thing is that some drugs are socially acceptable. Some aren't. And some aren't. And sadly, the ones that like alcohol causes the most damage in our the society. The most. Like it's by far. Catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Impacts, changes people's lives, destroys families, destroys children's lives. Yep. Trauma. And then so not having access to those services just says so much. And here's the thing. It's like, whether you use drugs casually, chaotically, or intermittently, mm -hmm. nobody deserves to die from them. And no everybody, one. you don't have to be drug-free and sober to access healthcare. No. And supervised consumption sites are healthcare for Period. people who use drugs. Period. That's it. End of story. Man, fantastic. Thanks, brother. Thanks for your time. I no, really do appreciate thank it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. And that, my friends, is... Uh... Guy Felicella, just an amazing human being uh, whose story of addiction and recovery and homelessness will shake you to your core. The man is uh, an advocate, uh, a public speaker, a, a person who will bring you to tears when you listen to some of the things he has to say. Lived experience. And one of the things that he says that he 
people alive first. Just a hell of a guy who's been to hell and back and lived on the streets for almost 20 years, I think, or over 20 years. And, and as anyone who has ever gone through that, and Dan, I know you have. Dan, if you want to join the show, let me know. I'll send you a link, buddy. If you want to come in and make some commentary this morning, I've got a little bit extra time. So let me just, I'll send you a link via, via the messenger thing. See, I'm really struggling this morning. I've not had a coffee yet, so I need a cup of coffee. Where did it go? I'll send Dan a message and I'll, get, I'll give you a link to the show if you want, Dan. Here we go. So yeah, it's just an amazing human being. And if you get a chance to check out uh, Guy's feed on the Twitter, I strongly recommend it. He has got stuff to say that's about building each other up and taking care of the marginalized. Uh, it's Restream, Dan, not, not StreamYard. So this might work. Give it a shot. Yeah, he talks about the marginalized and, and the downtrodden and how we can make things better. And as, as Ian DeYoung said just the other day, we know how to do this. The political will isn't there because the marginalized don't have a loud enough voice. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I was going into this thing skeptical because it's like, it's this huge, there's 2,000 people attending. It's the Shaw Center, the formerly the Ottawa Congress Center. It's now the Rogers Center. This big, beautiful building, catered meals. The food is amazing. There's endless Starbucks coffee. I'm not plugging for them, but I'm just telling you what's going on. Uh, there's all these companies there representing themselves, some major players that are there. And, and in my stomach, it's like, oh, man, this is just a business. Poverty is a business, and it's a big business that makes a lot of people a lot of money. And that's how I went into this. And to a degree, I'm, I still feel that way. I'll never let go of that because I do know that it is a big business. Poverty is a big business. And that's part of the reason why I think it's not been dismantled because there are some people making big money and those people are doing good work. I'm not taking that away from them. And you should get paid for your work. Absolutely. That's, I'm not taking that away either. But I do feel that if we started to house people, if we started to have the mental health supports, increase safe supply and safe consumption sites, we can get people clean and sober because addiction is a disease. It's a disease we can actually control 100%, but not 100% of the time, if that makes any sense to you whatsoever. I just heard a blip come in there. Is that Dan? No way. I heard something. Yeah, there he is. All right, brother. I'll bring you on in. Ladies and gentlemen, our friend, your friend, my friend, our buddy from Ward 15 in Toronto, Mr. Dan. Are you there, buddy? Can you hear us? Oh, it looks like the camera went away for you. We'll try it again in a second. Maybe jump in and out, possibly, if you need to. Uh, it was working. I don't know. I saw you there for a second, then it went away. Oh, there you are. You're back now. Okay. There you are, buddy. We got you on camera. Can't hear you, though. Yeah, no sound. Well, these things do happen, unfortunately. It's a little complicated sometimes. And I know trying to run Restream off a phone is not an easy feat. I've run entire shows off the phone and it's been, it crashes and it burns and it fails sometimes. And this morning has been an example of that. And yet I'm doing it in the studio with all the equipment. Okay, it looks like you've got a mic there, sir. Heard you there a second ago. Can you hear me, sir? Oh, we'll try it again in a minute. Might be just chugging through. It happens. It's been, it's been a strange, technologically challenging day. I don't like to say. I have a video here I want to show you. Uh, where is it? It just went away a second ago. 
I wanted to share this video with you while I grab a cup of coffee and give me a second here. Where did it go? Oh no. Oh, there it is. Okay. I've got it. So this is this is from wow, I'm blanking. A second here. Everything is failing for me today. From Rachel Gilmore. I have a video here that I think will you will find interesting. This is in regards to what's happening on the Twitter right now. I know this is a little bit off topic, but I'll just throw this on for the uh, two minutes and 19 seconds while I grab a cup of coffee and I'll come right back on the other side and we'll discuss more of what was taking place. One second. Elon Musk wants Twitter to be the best source of truth on earth, which is going great. But a cornerstone of Musk's effort, given he gutted content moderation teams that dealt with misinformation, has been the Community Notes tool. But research from the Center for Countering Digital Hate just came out, and they found that despite the fact that there are some dedicated Twitter users who provide accurate, well-sourced notes, just shy of three quarters of the accurate community notes in their sample were never shown to the public. The, the problem, according to CCDH, is that for a community note to be shown, there have to be enough people who rate it helpful. But when it comes to polarizing issues like the riots in the UK or election disinformation, that consensus, they said, is rarely reached. For their research, CCDH looked at over a million community notes to be able to identify which were about U.S. elections. And they ended up with a sample of 283 misleading posts about U.S. elections with proposed community notes. Posts that got 2.9 billion views total. Of those, 209 had accurate community notes proposed, but they weren't made public to all Twitter users. Those posts amassed 2.2 billion views and included false claims about Democrats importing illegal legal voters, about voting systems being unreliable, about the 2020 presidential election being stolen, and misleading claims about Donald Trump. Now, Community Notes was announced before Elon Musk bought the platform. Then it was called Birdwatch. But according to Twitter's former head of trust and safety, it was never meant to replace other methods of combating misinformation on the platform. But Musk has slashed the moderation team, arguably putting more and more pressure on these notes to combat on Twitter the same kind of steady stream of mis and disinformation we see across the internet. And in some cases on Twitter, those falsehoods are posted by Musk himself. When falsehoods go viral on any part of the internet, that can have serious consequences. After accounts on Twitter and Donald Trump on the debate stage falsely accused migrants in Springfield, Ohio of eating family pets, local schools received bomb threats. As of filming this video, still no community note on this tweet. Meanwhile, there were riots in the UK in large part because of racist misinformation posted across social media. So stay vigilant for falsehoods wherever you like to scroll. And if you're on Twitter, don't trust that every lie will get a community note attached. Because based on the sample in this research, it's very <laughs> possible it won't. What do you think of all this? I love Rachel's tagline. What do you think of all this? Because it, it, she's asking you to get engaged. And when it comes to, when it comes to community notes and Twitter and the spreading of mis and disinformation, we have certain politicians in this country who take part in that. We're going to have to bring it home. It's really disturbing to me that, okay, we can, let's do that. We'll do a pre-record, Dan. We'll do that. We'll, uh, we'll record something for a, a clip I can throw in tomorrow's show. Let's do that, sir. I will reach out to you shortly, uh, shortly after we, after I wrap up this morning's fiasco. <laughs> and I am terribly sorry, everybody, about the sudden crashing of the system. The whole show just fell apart. I feel, I feel that. I understand that. And uh, I empathize. It, it happens. It's frustrating. But yes, by all means, I, I, I strongly recommend that you follow uh, Guy Felicella if you're looking for information on uh, homelessness, addiction, safe supply, safe consumption, et cetera, how to address the issues, how to discuss as a community what we can do to make things better for people who are, let's face it, ill because it's an illness. It's, addiction is a disease. And if we don't treat people like human beings, not subjects for the background of a video you're shooting to promote your political ideology, if we don't treat people like human beings, how are they going to react? You treat me like a dog, I'm going to react like a rabid dog. That's human nature. So, show people. 
the respect that they want. Listen to somebody when they talk to you. Bang the monkey. Bang the monkey. What that means, for those of you who are not aware, is you are supposed to reach out to your... What I'm telling you to do is reach out to your MPP, your MLA, your city councillor, your MP. Let them know. Write the letters. Let them know. We need to do something about housing. We know that federally there is uh, action taking place right now. The federal liberal government is doing something to solve the housing crisis, which to a large degree, was created by the Liberal government under Jean Chrétien when he downloaded everything to the provinces to balance the budget. Yeah, we can talk about that at another date, but look, this is for the folks who think I'm just this left-leaning liberal lover, blah, blah, blah. I'm not. I don't love any political party. I never have and I never will. And I have to say that until I don't know how many times, till I'm blue in the face. But here's the thing. The, a lot of the problems we have today were created by past governments. It's a simple matter of fact. It starts, and it goes back to Mulroney. He downloaded everything to the provinces. Gretchen finished it. Harper suddenly let people, foreign nationals, have ownership of as much property as they wanted. And you have to understand something, too, that there's a CSIS report written from the late 90s on how they discovered that what was happening was that foreign nationals were buying tons and tons of property. Well, if I live in another country and I come and I buy a house in Canada and I want to speak to a member of parliament or a city councillor or a member of provincial parliament or provincial legislature, they go, well, I'm a homeowner. Okay, that's nice. Thank you. Have a nice day. But if I own a hundred houses or 10 buildings or a 60-story condo building, they're going to listen now. They will sit and listen to me as a foreign national, because I have influence, I have power, I have money, and I have put my money to work by buying me the power that I want. They will now listen to what I have to say. This has been going on since the late 90s. This is a fact. CSIS has a report about this. Foreign nationals gaining power in this country by purchasing houses to, in many cases, launder money and a large majority of them launder money but gain access to the local strings of power. It's how they can twist our democracy to suit their wants, needs, and desires. This is not hyperbole. It's fact. I'll dig up the CSIS report. I did see it the other day. It is, there's portions of it that are redacted, of course, portions that are not. I'll do some digging to find it, to get it to you. I'm going to try and have it for you tomorrow. But this, as foreign nationals buying up buildings, entire properties, entire communities, in many cases, there's nobody living in them. They buy them to launder money and saying we're having a housing shortage or a housing supply problem while they drive up the price of real estate past the point of me being ever able to afford anything. Now they're buying rental properties. And it's gotten to the point where financialized rental properties will go up and buy a building like the one I'm living in, which was bought by a large corporation here in Ottawa, one of about four that owns 75% of the rental stock in the city. Now they can charge whatever they want. They take a one bedroom and turn it into a two bedroom and charge $2,400 a month. Bachelors are now one bedrooms. They've turned the bachelor apartment to a one-bedroom. So your one-bedroom bachelor, your bachelor, which is not big, is now one-bedroom, which is now smaller. And they're charging $2,200 a month. I don't pay. I pay less than half that. My rent goes up in February, finally over the $1,100 mark. It's fine. They increased it by 2.5%, which is the legal amount. And I know that they're going to try and rent evict a bunch of us, but we're forming a tenants' union, if you will, with another building across the street, which is also owned by the same corporation. And what we're going to do is make sure we can get ourselves some representation so that they don't rent evict us. Because if I get rent evicted, uh, I'll, I don't know what I'll do. Yeah, okay, look, I'm. 
I know I can go move in with Bridget, right? But that I'm losing my autonomy. I'm losing my independence. I'm losing my neighborhood, which I've lived in for 14 years that I love. And now I can't even afford to live here if I tried to move in here today. So what we're doing is we're forcing people into the streets. We are creating a homelessness problem. Corporations, with hand in hand with government, because government's allowing this to happen, we're creating this. We are creating a homeless population because, let's face it, one catastrophic accident and I'm on ODSP. Sure, I'll get a settlement if the accident was somebody else's fault. But between now and then, and that can take years sometimes, I'm going to suffer. ODSP would not cover my rent. I would be effectively homeless because the system is set up to make it so. Ontario Works, which is a, used to be called welfare, the welfare system. For a single male, I would get, and this has not changed in 12 years, by the way, $750 for a month. Okay, my, my rent's almost 1100 It's 1089 is my rent. So how am I going to pay my rent when I'm $300 short? We have a big problem. So if I have a catastrophic accident and I have to wait for ODSP, which still wouldn't even cover my rent, I have to find another source of income. Well, I'll live off my savings, which is what I'm doing right now because my severance is basically near the end of its rope. So what happens then? Do I become a homeless person because corporate greed wants to make me pay more when I'm already paying my fair share? The big problem here that people don't seem to take into account is that salaries, wages, have not increased commensurate to the cost of living. What was the rule? Your cost of housing should never be more than 30% of your income. Well, single, sorry, thank you, 733. Yeah, 733 for a single person rate on Ontario Works. That's what it was 12 years ago. That's what it is today. 12 years, it's not increased a nickel. We are act effectively as society and as our governments are doing, pushing people out of housing and into the streets because a few greedy people want more. And I don't know how to put an end to it, but we definitely need to do something. Sure, the federal government is building housing. Yes, they will have a new uh, housing supply. But how soon before a new federal gov government comes in and cancels all that program? Because Pierre Polyev said he would do exactly that. And he would let the private sector take it over. The government shouldn't be in the business of building houses. Well, except when the private sector gouges individuals to the point where your salary is now 80% used to cover your housing costs. We have a problem here. Housing costs have gone up like 400% over the last 30 years. Guarantee you my salary has not increased that much. This year, I was able to surpass what I earned in 2017 for the first time. Or 2016, I should say. 2016, I earned, this year, I earned $2,000 more than I did in the year 2016. Still, I'm not in the middle class, I'm still working class. And that's, what, eight years? Eight years it took me to get back to what I once had, and now I don't have. I'm not whining, I'm stating facts. We are actively pushing people into the streets because a few greedy people just want more. So yes, we are forming a tenants union, I guess you could say, to make damn well sure we stay here because I ain't leaving. I will not become a statistic. I know what my rights are. And when, I, when needed, when required, 
I will put my blue suit jacket on and walk into a courtroom and say what needs to be said. Because I will not be pushed around by some big greedy asshole. We the people will fight back. We will push back. And with that, folks, I bid you adieu. I know this has been a very disjointed show, and I apologize. I'll see if I can stitch the two together a little bit later on. Technology sometimes can go a little bit sideways, and today was one of those days, and I apologize for it. I do have to get wrapped up. I have to take Lola out, and then I'm heading off to the CAEH 2024 Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness Conference 2024. I will get some more photos and some more video and hopefully an interview or two for you today. I'm going to put some stuff together for tomorrow as much as I can with the time that I have because I do have a very busy day ahead of me. And again, I apologize for today's hiccups, to say the least. We'll give you the old happy Halloween and thank our sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, CanadianTarot.com, and the Peppermaster for providing us with support from day one. Before we even put our first show on the air, they were there for us. You can also catch us, as you are well aware, on um, our pod page at True North Eager Beaver Media on our podpage.com slash True North Eager Beaver. I believe that's the address, but you can scan the QR code, which is on the screen right now, if you are watching live. And if you want to donate some funds to us, you can send money to us in Super Chat right here on YouTube, or you can scan the QR code right up here in the corner, TNEB Coffee. That's our coffee page, which I will put the script on there for you. Where is it? It's our coffee.com. It's, what is the other? ko-fi.com slash eager beaver and you can donate there if you like if you're watching now you can scan the qr code and go straight there to donate our pod page is um, podpage.com forward slash the true north eager beaver with a hyphen between each word you can also find us on apple podcasts or wherever you get your fine podcasts of course but if you go to apple podcasts and give us a five-star rating or a one-star rating and leave a comment everything helps even the bad stuff helps because it gets you noticed. So I'd like to say thanks to the individual yesterday who thought I was a left-wing socialist. I asked him, I said, why don't you watch the whole show? He didn't like anything I had to say. Okay, fair enough. That's fine. You don't have to like what I have to say. But we always tell the truth. And sometimes you're not going to like the truth, especially if it flies in the face of your belief system. Your belief system might be skewed. Because we're here to support people. We're here a community. We're here to lift each other up. One of the reasons we have this show is to promote information, truthful, factual information to the public. Another reason is to build a community where we can help each other out. And now we're forming a charity, the Mental Health Walk, that will take place, hopefully, willingly, every Saturday before Father's Day, so that we can spread the message that men need some support too. All right, I got to get out of here. I'm going to take Miss Lola out for a walk. So it's time to cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfeed Mysteries from Corvid Room Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients, grill your taste buds, and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. I have a quick, interesting Easter egg for you. As we know, there's an election coming up in the United States of America. And, well, it's getting to be heated. Let's have a look at this. They said, sir, I just think it's inappropriate for you to say. I said, well...
I'm going to do it whether the women like it or not. I'm going to do it whether the women like it or not. 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 I'm going to do it whether the women like it or not. They said, sir, I just think it's inappropriate. Well, all right, kids and cubs, I will see you tomorrow. And hopefully I'll have some more information for you about that thesis reporting. Let's see if I can dig it up. You will take care.